Great. Okay, so yeah, uh, going to be talking today about Harry Potter and the quest for true business value and trying not to make that uh, uh, the link between uh, this uh, topic and Harry Potter completely gratuitous. Uh, so you can tell me at the end of it whether I achieved that goal or not. Um, we'll try and keep it fairly light, fairly interactive. Um, so yeah, and hopefully we'll have a, uh, have a, fun, a fun evening. So I can assure you this is probably the most boring slide in the deck. Um, but it's part of the backstory for this whole uh, talk. So what you're looking at here is call center volumes for a large banking, a large transactional banking system. And they're sitting around three and a half thousand a month. So that's a lot of people phoning the call center a month. Um, and we, when we're working with this, we decided that this would be a good, um, this would be a really uh, good pilot uh, for Agile. So we, uh, to do password reset, okay, as an Agile pilot on this large transactional banking system. And in the past, at that stage, I was actually managing the business and systems analysis team uh, in this area of the bank. And uh, I looked back as to how long features took to deliver. And most of them took about two to three years, which is typical. It's actually, if you, if you truly really look at how long features take in your traditional kind of big project environments, that's how long they take from sort of concept to, to, to production, two to three years. And we managed to deliver password reset in six weeks. So this was fantastic. Um, you know, this agile thing works. We had a nice party with pizza and beer um, and we declared success. And we had a incentive uh, program as well at uh, Standard Bank. And a few people even got a boat trip to Mauritius on the back of password reset. So this was fantastic. Okay, great, great success. Okay, or was it? And unfortunately, what you're looking at here is actually the after picture. So this is 18 months after we had that party and the beer and the pizza and all of that. And actually, the, poor, the call center volumes were still sitting at three and a half thousand. So really what had happened is we'd produced an output, but we hadn't achieved the outcome. And no one actually seemed particularly bothered. I mean, I think I was the first person. The reason why I actually asked uh, for the stats was I was going to use it as an example in a presentation I was doing at Agile Africa. And uh, I still ended up using it as an example, but uh, I guess in a totally different uh, context. Okay, so that was just, that's just sort of the backstory for all of this. And I will uh, draw on this example a couple of times uh, during tonight's presentation. So uh, I shared when we were doing the bit of the, the chat before that today I'm only gonna be doing one running analogy and this is it. So really when I look back, it, it wasn't that, um, it, it was very uncommon when you actually evaluate, when we release things, we declare success when it, it's production ready, when we consider it done. And really liken that to saying it's almost like celebrating getting to the start line of the Comrades Marathon. So yes, it's quite an achievement to get there, but really you, it's not something to brag about. You know, no one's interested that you got to the start line of the Comrades Marathon. They're interested in how you do, you do once the starting gun, uh, gun actually fires. So you're know, being there, done there, uh, being there, done that, got the t-shirt is the kind of, I guess the cliche it's saying. Uh, in running circles, you definitely can't wear the t-shirt unless you've earned the shirt. So uh, no runner with his, with his or her salt would wear a shirt for a race that they haven't done. Um, and we, I think we tend in, in very often in our organizations, we declare success far too early. So we claim the, you know, we claim the, we, we, we've uh, achieved our goal, but actually we've only got to the start line. Um, so obviously in running, you're only getting your medal when you cross the finish line. Um, and just thought that, you know, basically what we're doing is we're awarding us, ourselves the equivalent of our participation certificate by celebrating when we are, when we consider it done, when, when our, our products are built or our code is ready, our features are ready. Um, so I just want to move that so I can see my slides. Okay. And really we just, you know, when do you want to celebrate when you actually cross that finish line? So it's all about actually checking the race results. Okay, not, not just uh, making it to the start line. So really once that production start and fires, the only thing that really matters is how well your features perform in a competitive environment. Okay, so what actually happens? Are the users using them? Is it making their life better? Um, in some cases we might find out it actually makes their life worse. Okay. What is the organizational equivalent of participation trophies? Okay, ship it awards. There's a, a tweet here from a guy called Ron Kohavi. We'll talk a bit more about him later. And uh, this is, was from uh, November 8th, 2014, the day that Microsoft stopped rewarding uh, the shipping. 
So up until then, they had big incentive schemes around shipping. Uh, they had this plaster on the front walls. You see that uh, every time a product ships, it takes us one step uh, closer to, uh, to the vision. But actually, it, very often it doesn't. Uh, you'll see his, his comment here, not shipping is often better, and we'll also cover that later. Okay, sometimes by shipping products that actually don't work or aren't great or aren't fit for purpose, it actually takes us further away from the vision, not closer to it. Okay. Um, there's a quote there from him, shipping is not the goal, shipping something useful to the customer is the goal. And very often, you know, shipping is actually fairly easy, like I said before, getting to the start line. So it was, it, it's relatively easy, still some hard work goes into it, but really we wanna make sure that it's something useful uh, to the customer. Okay, so the way I phrase this is saying ship happens. So the true test of our software changes is not that they are defect free and work according to spec, but rather that they achieve the expected benefit. So once again, it's this whole uh, shipping it is just an, an output. We're trying to drive uh, the right outcome. So um, Yovanka, if you don't mind pulling up the first poll. So first question uh, for those of you uh, on the call today is um, if you can let me know what percentage of changes result in value for your organization. Okay, so in the organization that you are currently working in, what percentage of changes, and I put this in asterisk, so statistically significant beneficial results. Okay, so we can actually prove it statistically. We know that, our, that this change has achieved the intended result. Okay, so if you don't mind just uh, voting there. And we'll observe those results once they're through. The vote's coming through, Ivanka. So obviously I can't see them, you can. Uh, it doesn't seem they come through, they're coming through. Um, no, it, they do, sorry. Okay. No, nobody voted, sorry. Nobody voted yet, is that correct? People are you voting? I can see the votes coming through, Ivanka. Uh, then I don't, all right. So maybe because you, you co-host, so it took over perhaps. So if they are coming through, if you don't, uh, um, Hilda, if you don't, if you're able to share it onto the screen. Should I end the poll? Yeah, I think we've probably given people enough time to, to vote. Okay, uh, great. I'm up on my, on my screen now. Okay, so I can see it here. Okay, okay. so we've got about a third of the can people. Can I stop and share results? Here. Sorry, Hilda, go for it. I'm going to stop and share the results. Can you see? Uh, can you see the results? Yes, I can see it on my screen. So hopefully everyone can. Uh, just mm -hmm. if you can't, um, the no idea was about a third, thirty-three percent, less than twenty-five percent. Uh, Twenty, sorry, less than twenty-five percent was twenty-nine percent of the callers. Twenty-five to fifty percent was about twenty-five, so one in four, and fifty to seventy-five was uh, thirteen percent. Okay, so it might be a, a nice discussion. I'd love to hear from the people who are on the top end there, the 50 to 75, what they're doing. Because um, what I've found is that it's incredibly rare. I've, I've been looking around at just, you know, online and at the data and how many organizations actually truly track the outcomes of the changes that, they, that they're getting that change. But this just kind of positions it. So what we're really looking at is that uh, over half of the people on the call, well over half, in fact, two thirds of the call, either it's a less than 25% or no idea as to what those changes are having. Okay. So we'll move forward now. So this is not a poll, just a, just a general question for you. Um, you can answer in your head if you want to, if you really want to answer in the chat, you can as well. But just to consider at Microsoft. So Microsoft, obviously a company that uh, generally speaking has uh, good well thought ide ideas. Um, obviously they're able to employ the best, the top uh, software engineering skills uh, yeah, globally. Um, could just consider what percentage of changes result in value at Microsoft. Okay, and Microsoft, uh, generally they do track, they run uh, experimentation labs and things like that. They do a lot of A-B testing. And answer, 33%. So only one in three changes at Microsoft actually result in a statistically relevant benefit. Okay, which is quite an incredibly low, low figure. So if you think about that, um, you know, if you were gambling, that's not great odds. Almost the, the house always wins if you're taking that. Um, there is a, um, just a link there uh, for, that, for that data. 
And there's a book there, uh, Ron, Ron Kohavi is one of the co-authors of that, worthwhile checking out that book. Um, okay, then the next question for you, what percentage of changes result in value in optimized systems like Bing and Chrome? So maybe just consider, do you think it would be higher? We've got sent the, sent the anchor at Microsoft as a whole being about one in three, 33%. Do you think Bing and Chrome, that they would be higher or lower uh, on an optimized uh, system? Okay, so just to consider that. And the answer is it's about 10 to 20%. So it's quite a lot lower. So why is that? It's because they're optimized systems. So it's far harder to actually make big changes because they really, they've got all the low hanging fruit. Uh, they've run lots and lots of tests. Uh, generally, they've got incredibly high sample sizes to run them on and things like that. Um, and you know, they've run a lot of uh, ideas through those systems. So, so you're looking at about one to two in 10 changes actually having a benefit on, on these optimized systems like Bing and Chrome. So very, very low, low percentages. Okay, so I suppose I should go get on to the Harry Potter and uh, be true to the title and, and relate this, this whole topic back there. So obviously, as you know, Harry Potter's uh, sidekick, his best mate is Ron. So we're gonna look at Ron. Okay, so that's Ron, Ron Kohavi in this case of this talk. And Ron's report card is on the left there. Um, so quite a, you know, quite an impressive CV. He's currently the vice president and a technical fellow at Airbnb. Uh, before that, for many years, he ran the experimentation lab at Microsoft and was a technical fellow, corporate vice president there. Before that, he was at Amazon. Um, so yeah, I guess a, a nice uh, three, three uh, companies there to have on your CV. Uh, he's a PhD in computer science. He must be one of the only PhDs I know who doesn't put doctor in front of his name. Um, so that's, that, that I was quite impressed with. Um, and I normally, as soon as someone gets a PhD, then they change that title to doctor. He doesn't seem to do that. I've written a lot of papers and books, over 40,000 citations. And just an interesting fact about him, he's actually the guy together uh, with a colleague of his who coined the term hippo. So hippo, the highest, highest paid uh, person's opinion. Uh, there's a nice little interesting story if you follow that link. I'll make the uh, presentation available afterwards. You can read up a whole story about how it occurred. Um, quite a nice little bit of, yeah, I guess, a uh, nice little article, bit of interest there. Okay, so that's, uh, that's uh, is Ron Kohavi. Um, I first came across his name when I was reading the DevOps handbook and um, the one, one of the things that stood out for me about the book was it's almost a side remark and a section of AB testing, which is around page 250 in the DevOps handbook. And it was this quote from him saying, evaluating well-designed and executed experiments that were designed to improve a key metric, only about one third were successful in improving the key metric. So basically, this is this whole thing at Microsoft and, and this was the work that he did and put in place uh, he, he instilled this whole experimentation approach at Microsoft. Um, when you actually looked at the figures, what they showed you, um, it's almost in a way quite depressing that only one in three actually achieves an intended benefit. Um, it's also just stated in that book, um, the link is there. One, so basically just, yeah, I guess a simpler way of saying it, only one of every three changes will result in intended, intended improvements. And actually, um, he'll go on further to state that one in three it makes no difference. So basically didn't, you know, it's just adding code, additional code to your code base. It wasn't positive, it wasn't negative, it was just there. And one in three changes would actually have a negative impact. Okay, and something we'll look at um, later. So it would actually have a negative impact and actually be to the detriment of your system and to your customers. So um, this is something, uh, Kohavi's law. So it's something that I've, I've, uh, I've coined Kohavi's law. If you Google Kohavi's law, you'll probably only find stuff, articles uh, that I've written on this, but I do believe it's, it's a credible law. And basically there's only one change in three will yield a positive result. Uh, the obvious cor corollary to that is that two out of three changes will have no detectable impact or will have a negative outcome. Okay, so that's, uh, that's what I would call Kohavi's law. Um, in searching around for companies that are, um, are actually collecting data, open about it, uh, by 33% is pretty much the highest. There was one I could find claiming a 40% success rate was the absolute highest, and very often it's lower. So like people like um, on, on Google, on the optimized systems, it's quite a, quite a bit lower than that one in three. So, so almost you're looking at a best case scenario when you actually um, look at that, uh, look at your results. Uh, typically of getting that positive result. But I would be having said that, I'd be very interested to chat to those people who say that they're getting 50 to 75%. So maybe that's a topic at the end of this talk uh, to evaluate. 
So just a, um, been a, a quote there from him. I've been fortunate enough to have a few uh, email conversations, electronic conversations with him, and basically this quote, evaluating ideas with controlled experiments was humbling. It showed how poor intuition and expert opinions are. Another way he describes it, he says that people, they think their ideas are like babies. He says his job is to tell people that their babies are ugly. Okay, that most of them actually are bad ideas that they don't, they don't actually work in practice. If you do want more than that, there's a link there. Uh, just an article I wrote on my blog uh, just goes into a bit more detail about, about that um, and about the, the, the process that he followed. Yeah. So uh, once again, just before we get into Harry, we need to talk about Alice. So unfortunately, I uh, couldn't uh, tie Hermione into this uh, story, but we'll have to do with Alice. Uh, for those of you who uh, listen to Smoky Records, you might be having something else going on in your head, but I will explain exactly who Alice is right now. So this obviously isn't Alice, this is Alice's dad. Um, his name is Nigel Newton, and he is the CEO and, uh, of Bloomsbury Publishing. So you'll recognize that name if you like the Harry Potter books. They were the, they eventually were the, the publishers who picked up um, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. So um, it's actually only because of Nigel Newton's eight-year-old daughter, Alice, that Harry Potter got published. So what happened was that uh, he got home one day, he had a photocopy, photocopy of the manuscript of the first three chapters. Very recently, Bloomsbury had decided to uh, start looking at publishing uh, kids' books and opening up a, a kids' book kind of division. He had this, and kind of as an afterthought, he gave this to his daughter to say, oh, take, a, take a read of this, uh, tell me what you think. And this is a direct quote from him. She came down from the room an hour later glowing, saying, Dad, this is so much better than anything else and she nagged and nagged me for the following months, wanting to see what came next. And uh, interesting enough, I, I like that, the following months. So it wasn't like he believed her straight off that this was a good book and a good proposition and would make them uh, billions of, of dollars. Um, it was her, her nagging that actually did it. So basically she read it, one sitting an hour later said, this is fantastic, where's the rest? <clears throat> and because it was given to the intended audience, an eight-year-old girl, uh, I guess the rest is history. So just to look at what that actually means, what that history is around, uh, around the Harry Potter story. So J.K. Rowling had, um, had this manuscript rejected by every major publisher. Um, so every major publisher, a lot of minor publishers looked at this and said, nah, you know, kids' books don't sell, particularly kids' books written by women, or wizard about wizards by women don't sell. That was the kind of feedback that she got. Interesting enough, that's actually why she went with Jake. She's got no middle name, um, but... Uh, they were worried that uh, boys wouldn't buy a, buy a book uh, written by Joanne Rowling. So J.K. Rowling was chosen. Apparently K is Kathleen, which is her mother's name, which is why she chose the K. A bit of trivia there as well. And really it was only published because of this persistent pester power of an eight-year-old girl, okay, because she believed it and she liked it. Uh, the massive leap of faith that Bloomsbury took Okay, in retrospect, not such a massive leap of faith, only 500 copies. Apparently, most of those 500 copies were sent to schools and libraries, so they weren't even available for sale. They were actually distributed out there. Um, uh, I just went in researching this, uh, this talk. I saw that very recently a, a, a first edition hard copy, one of those 500 with a damaged binding, uh, sold for 33,000 pounds in auction recently, so they're worth a lot of money. They actually look like this one over here. So if you've got a copy like that and hard copy with this cover uh, worth a lot of money, hang on to it. Um, estimated worth of the Harry Potter franchise now over 25 billion. So that fi first 500 copies uh, spawned a dynasty of 25 billion and I guess growing, you could say, uh, of, of, of value. Okay. And it's made Joanne Rowling the world's first and only billion dollar author. I think also she's only, the only um, self-made um, uh, female uh, billionaire. Sorry, a question? No? Okay. Um, and really just, I think this highlights just how bad our expert opinion, experience and intuition are at predictors of success. <clears throat> so if you think about it in publishing, you've got the experts. They're reading books all the time. Okay, they know the industry. Okay, well, that's what they will tell you. Um, publishing is also an industry where they will tell you that every now and again, they're gonna take a flyer. Okay, I've got a good feeling about this, a hunch. Yeah, I'm gonna go on, on a bit of a wing here and let's take a chance on this story. No one was prepared to, to do that with Harry Potter and only because of a nature of girl actually it ended up being published. Uh, just interestingly enough, um, apparently the same thing actually happened with J.R.R. Tolkien with The Hobbit. It was apparently a guy called Stanley Unwin who's a publisher, his son, 
it got hold of the the draft, really liked it. That's how The Hobbit got published um, as well. So it's not the first time uh, that that's happened. Okay, so time for me to take a quick break from talking and time for you for the second poll for tonight. So what I'd like you to do here is to predict the winner. So you've got two different screens, search screens from Microsoft Bing um, that are appearing there. I want you to pick, do you think the one on the left will get more clicks, the one on the right will get more clicks, or there'll be no difference? So we'll have, so which result will happen? Win, I guess, win, lose, or tie. Um, so if you think the left one will get more clicks, uh, obviously vote left. If you think the right one, vote right. If you think there'll be no statistically significant difference between the two, uh, click, uh, click tie. And I'll just take a sip of water and give you uh, a chance to vote. And I guess Hildor Yavanka, once you can see that uh, there's a sort of a critical mass of votes, uh, then you can close the poll and share the screen. No problem. I'll give them just a few seconds more. Okay. Yeah, a couple more seconds. Okay, cool. Okay, I'm going to end the poll and then share it. Great. Okay, so that's quite, that's actually quite amazing. We've got about a third of the people saying left, a third saying right, and a third saying tie. Okay, so interesting results there. Okay, so I guess it kind of highlights how hard it is to predict stuff. Um, okay, so I will give you the answer now. Okay, and that is, oops, let's go there. Okay, so that is the one on the right. Okay, if I had to ask you how much, okay, the, I've actually given you the answer there on the top of the screen. The one on the right, produced a hundred million dollars of additional revenue uh, for Microsoft okay per, per annum okay so massive massive amounts but incredibly hard to see that uh, and I'm actually I'm calling this the Harry Potter of software changes okay so why you can just see on the screen here a little bit more detail so exactly what they did this was the existing screen on the left and all they did was they moved a bit of text and highlighted it onto the actual URL Okay, so very, very simple change to go and do. Now, the incredible thing with this change and why I call it the Harry Potter of software changes was that this change sat on the backlog for six months. It was considered a low priority change. Okay, now you've got to remember that this is now Microsoft. You're running an experimentation lab. They're used to actually seeing a lot of, a lot of ideas not working and, and so on and, and really trusting in the data, but no one gave this uh, change a chance. In fact, the only person who did was the developer who proposed it. So he proposed this idea, it sat in the backlog for six months, and he thought, you know what, stuff it. He came up in the weekend and made the change. He made it one weekend, um, understand it wasn't a particularly big change, probably you know, took him a few hours to go and do, and came back on Monday morning, and obviously the results went crazy and made them $100 million per annum of additional revenue. Okay, so um, just goes to show you, yeah, how hard it is to predict and what some of these changes, um, yeah, I guess no one would, you know, you might even struggle to believe it now um, that that's, you know, that this tiny change would have such a big impact on, on revenue. And we'll look at a few more later as well. Okay, so uh, what I'm gonna do now is actually gonna go and take you through, I know a lot of organizations these days are coming up with playbooks. So uh, I'm gonna say it's time to throw away the playbooks that actually produce a spell book, okay? So how do we produce the magic? What are the magic potions and recipes and so on uh, to get this business value that we are all hearing about and that we all want to achieve? So the first spell, and this is actually where my Latin came in handy again. So as Yovanka mentioned, I did matric Latin. Actually, the reason for that is uh, I was originally intending to be a lawyer because I figured I liked arguing with people. Um, but, uh, and in South Africa, we do Ro Roman Dutch law. So uh, if you don't do Latin at school, you've got to do five years of school Latin and first year varsity. And I figured that that would probably interfere with my social life. So I did it that way. And anyway, and in first year, I decided I liked uh, uh, computers more than I liked arguing with people. So I, I switched my stream to information systems. 
So the first spell we've got here is Intelligere Minimum Viable Productum. So if you're familiar with Harry Potter, you'll know that, uh, yeah, it's a bit of a long-winded spell, but a spell, spell nevertheless, uh, which translates as understand the minimal viable product. So to illustrate this, there's a picture over here of a very complicated traffic circle. Um, so if you consider, I'm not sure if you can go off mute, so I'll ask this question if people can go off mute, if someone wants to shout out uh, what they think would be a good answer. So very often there's, there's a lot of misunderstanding about what a minimal viable product is. People think you've actually got to produce the whole thing. So if you consider what is the biggest risk with the traffic circle, if you think about Kojave's law and we've got a one in third chance of having a negative result, in this case, could it be that actually we want to improve the flow of traffic by putting in a traffic circle? Worst case scenario, we actually make it worse. So the question I've got for you now is how can we test this minimal viable product so how could we test whether we're going to make the traffic better or worse or make no difference to it without building the entire traffic circle? Okay, so any, anyone uh, brave enough to go off mute and uh, voice an opinion how they would do that? If they can go off mute, so I can't see the I can't actually see the the, the chat at the moment. So they can go off mute. They um, go off mute. Okay, yes, cool. they can. Cool. And there is nothing in the chat at the moment. Nothing in the chat. Okay, cool. Uh, the roads still exist. So could you just put cones in the middle? Okay. Yeah. Great. Uh, yeah. No, that's exactly how a great way to test. The best way I know of any way of testing this, and I have asked this to a lot of people. So sometimes people say well, we can make a, write a computer program and simulate it and so on. But the easiest way, the simplest way, we can put, create a temporary structure and create some cones and see what happens. So maybe even for a couple of hours in rush hour or for the day, uh, see what happens. Do we make traffic better or worse? And then make a decision then. So if we make it better, proceed then with building the circle. No difference. Don't do it. Make it worse. Definitely don't do it. And maybe look for another option. Um, so for those of you, I live in the Bryanston area. And um, there's a traffic circle near Riverside Center, if anyone's familiar with that, where Bryanston drives draw in Summit. There's a traffic circle there. That's actually where this whole idea came from that they built several years ago to alleviate traffic. It's made the traffic congestion much worse. Okay. So, and uh, very often we do that unintentionally with the way that we uh, release our products and our features as well. We think it's going to make things better. We actually make it worse and no one probably often bothers to go and check afterwards that we've actually made our, our uh, customer's life uh, slightly more difficult, not, not better. Okay, so that's just a, just a very simple example about how we can often do something very, very quickly. The worst way to test um, the minimal viable product is to build the whole system. That's the most expensive and slowest way. Very often there are quick ways of, of doing it before we proceed um, and we, we carry on. Um, it's one of these big misunderstood terms in my mind, minimal viable product. A lot of people think it's the first release of a product. Actually, what you're trying to do is test whether your product is viable or not in the quickest, most efficient way with a reasonable level of accuracy. And then you're making a, a stop, a pivot, or a continued decision based on that. Okay. Um, so there's time for a next poll now. So this is a tricky one. So either you're going to let me, so, so basically the poll, if you don't mind uh, popping that up, Hilda Yavanka. So to test a minimal viable product, you've seen the first spell. I've got 10 spells here in my spell book. So the question for you is, should I quit now? Okay, enough already with the spells and we just end up this whole thing and we all go home early. Or would you like to see the other nine spells? Okay, so that's how I'm testing uh, the rest of this, of, of this talk. So while you are voting, obviously, um, I've already produced the other nine spells. So I'm hoping that I, I will uh, uh, get, to, get to share them with you. This is more just an illustration. But if, obviously, if I was doing a presentation like this, the, the most, the riskiest thing is, I guess, A, no one wants to hear the presentation. So I'm doing a conference presentation. It's, it's a bit silly to prepare the whole presentation before it's been accepted to a conference. And the second one would be, maybe my topic is boring people. So how can I test that? So this is a nice way, if I've got a list of 10 things, you do one slide, you test it and ask people for feedback. Do you want to hear the other nine? If they say yes, great, we carry on. Um, and if, we, if they say no, well, then you put your tail between your legs and you go and think up another idea that might be more interesting. Okay. So I guess the question, Yvonne can hold it, do I want to see the results? You do. Okay, so it's 100%. So thanks. That's, that's nice feedback from, from everyone. Okay, so we will, uh, we will carry on then. 
Okay, so our second spell here is Avoido Superstes Inclin Inclinatio. So I will tell you what that translates to shortly. Uh, let me just highlight, there is a, a, a World War II bomber plane, a Royal Air Force bomber plane uh, that's on your screen now. Um, so there's a problem in that obviously these bombers, they're going across to Germany, they're trying to bomb the hell out of the Germans. The Germans are obviously trying to do the same in the Battle of Britain. Um, and these planes are getting shot up. So the red marks there represent um, analysis of the planes that are you know, where the planes are getting shot. And what they're trying to do now is they're trying to uh, determine, the Royal, Royal uh, Air Force is trying to determine where do they put reinforced armor. Now the dilemma that they've got is that armor is heavy and obviously it consumed, will, will consume more fuel in those planes. So um, there's only a limited amount of armor they can do, otherwise the planes aren't gonna make it back. They're gonna run out of, out of fuel before they get back. So consider maybe the total area of this is about five meters of where all the, all the analysis is showing the planes are getting shot. And they can probably only do a maximum about two and a half meters to three meters of armor on the planes. So um, once again, if anyone wants to shout out on uh, uh, Golf Mute and let me know where do you think you would put the reinforced armor. So you can't cover the whole plane. You're seeing here, we've got our analysis, our metrics are showing us where the planes are getting shot. We can't cover it all. Where do we, where do we cover? Where Obviously there's no good. shots. Hmm? Where there's no shots. Where there's no shots. Okay. So are you familiar with survivor bias? <laughs> but that's, that is exactly the right answer. Okay. So you might have been thinking, and very often when I, when I ask this, it takes a while to get to that conclusion. Hang on a minute. Where there's no shot. So that is the answer. That's where we put our reinforcement. Because those are the planes that aren't coming back. Those are the planes that are falling into the sea. They're getting shot down over Germany and, and, and so on. Um, and there's a thing called survivor bias. So very often what happens is we place much too much emphasis on what is visible. And normally we see visible as things that stay around. And survivor bias can actually be used in a negative light as well, because we remember uh, the, the big things. Uh, we tend to forget a whole lot of the other things. It also, I guess, highlights the fact that metrics can only do so much and um, that it's much more important to apply our, our knowledge and our brain power to the, the bigger picture of, of the metrics. The guy who came up with this, he actually, this was a real life scenario, it was a guy called Abram Wald. Um, so the, the spell here is avoid survivor bias. Um, I have put a link in there, very interesting story. Um, yeah, but exactly, they were deciding where to put it and he said, hang on a minute, what about the planes that aren't coming back? That's, that's actually what we should be looking at and taking into consideration. Um, there's another very interesting story from World War I. Um, this uh, is called a Brody helmet that were introduced in, in, during World War I. And also the powers that be, um, the generals and so on, the um, chief of staff said, hang on a minute, we've got a real problem here because we're suddenly getting inundated in our medical hospitals with people who've been wearing the helmets with head injuries. There's a problem, there's a defect with the helmets. Until someone on the ground pointed out, no, the reason why we're getting them is before they would be lying dead on the battlefield uh, with shrapnel wounds, now they actually are making it to the hospital. Okay, so very important that we actually understand the context of, of what uh, the data is saying to us. Another interesting, uh, very easy way just to illustrate this, if I had to ask you the question, <clears throat> do you think that they made, the toys that are made today are a lot uh, made, made worse than they were when we were kids? Okay, so I'm assuming a lot of people were, are no longer kids on the call or would no longer consider them kids. Um, or for, if you've got kids, you probably would agree with that statement, that the, the, the toys we had when I was a kid they made them a lot stronger, they were a lot more robust, they last a lot longer than the toys that are made today. Uh, same thing if I said to you, um, uh, do uh, buildings that are made today, um, compared to 100 years ago, are they as attractive? You'd probably say, no, buildings that were made 100 years ago are a lot more attractive, uh, better architecturally than they are today. So another, just another illustration of survivor bias, because we remember it's very difficult to prove or disprove, but we remember the ones that survive, we forget all the other things uh, that disappear. So in the case of buildings, ugly buildings are much more likely to get torn down and replaced by new buildings. Uh, so actually, uh, I know Vienna said, you asked me for two running uh, connotations. So I actually forgot, I actually did put in two, so I put in City Hall here, because that's obviously where uh, the Comrades Down Run starts in front of City Hall in Peter Maritzburg. Uh, so there actually is a second connotation. And, and a last uh, very macabre link, is this whole, there's a myth um, out there that uh, about cats. I'm, I'm just doing it so you know I'm a cat person, so I've got two cats myself. Um, but uh, there's this myth that a, a cat takes about six stories 
to realize it's falling and they've got a better chance of survival if they fall from higher than six stories and from lower than six stories. And unfortunately what happens is that if a cat falls from less than six stories, they're more likely to hit the ground, not be in a good state, but still be alive and taken to a vet. If they fall from higher than that, it's probably game over and they've gone to kitty heaven, definitely no point in taking them to the vet. But very occasionally a cat will survive from a higher height and we remember that. So yeah, just some, a couple of other examples of, of survivor bias. Okay, our third uh, spell then is Sempa Uta Hypothesis, which is always use hypothesis. Um, so <clears throat> on the screen, I've just got an example of a very bad feature. It's actually a real feature from a team that I worked with. Uh, you can read that, you won't understand what they're trying to do. Most of the people who were in that team uh, didn't understand what they were trying to do. Um, but what I've got down the bottom there is just restated actually as a feature hypothesis. So in this case, it was, if we enhance the audit report to include the relevant details for verification by the client, we will reduce errors by 95%. Exciting stuff. Okay, so, um, but uh, you, probably everyone on the call can read this hypothesis statement here. You won't understand how they're gonna do it, but you can understand what they're trying to do. Okay, so it brings a lot of clarity. Um, just the reason why I've crossed out the other stuff is it's just noise. So I was still learning at this stage. I would, in retrospect, uh, which will enhance the client experience. Yes, it probably will, but it's just noise. So uh, that's just why it's crossed out there. Okay, so always use the feature hypothesis. Um, why is this important? There's a lot of different reasons uh, here. So just to highlight one or two. Okay, so <clears throat> giving you a choice again, we won't go to a poll this time just to ask you, you can answer this in your heads. Okay, which feature would you rather work on? Option A, update some fields and order report. Ah, that's pretty boring. Okay, option B, Reduce client error rates by 95%, okay? Oh, that's quite exciting. That gives me a reason to get up in the morning, okay? Maybe uh, one day when I can have my friends around for a bra again, I'm far more likely to brag about option B. I reduce client error rates by 95%, okay? That's something to be proud of. I'm not gonna t tell them about how I've dated some fields and audit report, unless I wanna get rid of them because they're overstaying, they're welcome. So basically, these are the same things. On the left, though, as an output. On the right is an outcome, okay? So, and our outcomes help us to, we're in, in the development of our hypothesis, okay? Much, much, uh, much nicer, much more motivational to work on. Uh, so outcomes uh, is, which I would define as the delivery of value over outputs, which is just the delivery of volume, okay? Uh, I could talk, I've got a, uh, for this on uh, 45 minutes, and if you do wanna hear me talk about the power of feature hypothesis, there's a link there. Uh, it's actually the talk I did at Agile Africa uh, on this specific topic. Now, one of the other interesting things with this, with actually focusing on outcomes and hypotheses, it actually can unleash the creativity of your teams. And you might not believe me. Um, and the reason I've got that paper clip there uh, drawn this way is there's a test called the Guilford test, known colloquially as the genius test. Um, and basically what you do is you give someone a, an item like a paper clip and you ask them to think of as many different uses creatively as they can in a, I think it's a two minute time frame, and based on how many answers they come up with, you classify them as a genius or not. The, so you can think of paper clip, I can back scratch a, I don't know, nose ring, uh, I can use it as an iPhone reset device, um, you know, I don't know, potentially other things as well, a toothpick, uh, I don't know, ear scratcher, various different things. Um, and um, the interesting thing here is if, with, if you do this test with kindergarten students, about 80% of them will be classified as geniuses. As you go through the schooling system, it diminishes down to about, I think it's about 7%. If we did this on ourselves now, we'd be sitting at about 7%. Okay. Um, so how do we unleash the creativity of our teams? Very simple exercise to show how this works. Um, so uh, if you want to answer, you can go off mute once again. Um, so here's a scenario. <clears throat> we, you are on the Microsoft PowerPoint feature team. I'll be your product owner and I come to you and I say, um, I've got a new feature. I want you to create me a shortcut key to add a bullet point list in PowerPoint. Okay. So nice, easy feature, create a, bullet, a shortcut key to add a bullet point list in PowerPoint. So the question now is, does anyone know what the shortcut key is? So like it's not control B obviously, because control B will turn your text bold. Anyone know what the shortcut key is to add a new bullet point in PowerPoint or Word? Someone want to have a go? Stuart, are we allowed to use Google to search it? Because no, <laughs> I don't know. You can, but I'll probably give you the answer before then. Okay. So uh, why? Okay. So we've got 26 people, it looks like, on the call at the moment. 
Okay, none of us know what the shortcut key is. So if you did Google, uh, Vian, you would find there is none. Okay, so I was asking you a nasty trick question. Um, but I guess the question is, why is there none? Because there's a better way of doing it. So how would you add uh, quickly a bullet point, uh, ast uh, <clears throat> asterisk or hyphen and space will create that bullet point uh, list for you in PowerPoint. So if you consider that if I came to you, instead of telling you what I want you to, you to do, create a, bullet, a shortcut key, if I came to you with an unconstrained feature or chasing an outcome, allow users to create bullet points as easily as possible, that unleashes the creativity. And that's really what you wanna try and do when you're doing with features, is to phrase things in this way. Most of the time, stuff comes through telling people what to do. You can't be creative, even if you've got creative people in your team. They are just going to blindly go and deliver this, not think of the other options. If you phrase your features this way, and this is what we're considering, what is the outcome that we want to achieve? Yeah, a shortcut key is one way, but the other ways as well. And um, obviously what Microsoft settled on was the asterisk space. Okay. Uh, next spell, Lumos Quare, uh, which is the understand the why. Um, so I'll just take you pretty quickly through a couple of uh, fun examples. Uh, so this one is about the Washington Monument. Uh, you might probably recognize it from movie and TV shows. And we've got a problem that the Washington Monument is disintegrating. So question, why is the Washington Monument, uh, monument uh, disintegrating? Because we've got to clean it frequently with harsh chemicals. Why do we clean it so frequently? Because pigeons are pooping all over the monument. True, true story, this one, it's a real, real life scenario. Okay, why are pigeons pooping all over our monument? Because they're eating spiders, there are lots of spiders on the monument. Why are there so many spiders? Because they eat gnats and there are lots of gnats around the monument. Last why here, why are there so many gnats? Because they're attracted by the lights which are turned on at dusk. Okay, so how do we sort out this problem? Okay, often people will say, don't turn on the lights. Slightly better solution, turn on the lights an hour after dusk. Okay, so uh, in that case, we still get this beautiful picture here. Um, you know, nice for tourists when they fly over and that kind of stuff. You can see it from anywhere in Washington. Um, but we don't get the gnats, we don't get the spiders, we don't get the pigeons, the pigeon poop, we don't have to clean it so often. Now, very often what happens is we just focus on these, one of these first two over here without understanding the problem uh, properly, without understanding the true why. And if we had a bit more time, we could go through it. I could ask you what were your solutions in your head, be things like investigating in better chemicals or putting cages around the monument or hiring the NRA to come shoot the pigeons or you know, kind of big solutions. But often there's a very neat uh, solution if we understand the true root cause. Okay, so which in this case was turn on the lights an hour after dusk. Um, slightly more serious example now. Uh, the first one was a bit frivolous. Uh, the guy in the top left is a guy called Richard Sternen. He invented a concept called positive dissonance from helping to solve childhood uh, malnutrition in Vietnam. So he represented an organization called Save the Children. Uh, he was just by himself, one person. Um, and he says, typically what would happen is people would focus on big issues like poverty, sanitation, corruption. He calls them TBUs, true but useless. What he did very interestingly is he said, hang on a minute, there's some kids who are not malnourished, why? And maybe they were the chief's kid or they had an uncle working for the government in Hanoi, so they were getting more money. He excluded them. He said, there's still there's some kids who are not malnourished, why? And, and it boiled down to a number of different factors, including things like um, that their parents would feed them crag, crabs and shrimps from the rice paddies, which were considered an adult food, but obviously they're full of protein, just the same way you probably wouldn't feed your, your babies uh, sushi. Okay, but that's what the kids who were getting that were less malnourished. Um, things like instead of feeding twice a day, which was traditional, the same amount of food five times a day. Um, there, were, there were a couple of other different factors that he did there as well. Uh, also like the communal uh, eating. Um, they would put the food in the middle, everyone helped themselves. But parents who were actively feeding their kids were less malnourished. It makes sense if you've got kids yourself, you know, dinner times can sudden, sometimes be an orderly long affairs. Um, uh, another funny one was that uh, when the kids had diarrhea, I was always told you starve out diarrhea, but apparently feeding the kids during diarrhea meant that they were less malnourished as well. And the beauty of this was he didn't say, I'm the clever American, I've got all your answers. He actually then worked with groups of mothers. He actually started out with almost like an agile team, a group of 10 mothers. And he essentially transferred the knowledge. They then transferred it wider and wider and ended up solving uh, reducing malnutrition in Vietnam by 85%, so positively impacting the life of 2.2 million people. Okay, understanding the true problem, working with it, 
and yeah, uh, rolling it out. Uh, so just a nice example. Uh, yeah, the city invented something called positive dissonance. Uh, there's quite a lot in the web about that if you're interested. Easy way to explain this concept as well. If your child or if you, when you were a kid, you came home with a report card with one A, a couple of Bs, a couple of Cs, a couple of Ds and an F, what do your parents focus on? The F, okay, what should you focus on? The A, how do you replicate that? What's going right um, is really what he's saying. Okay. So without understanding the why, we're really shooting in the, in the dark um, and it's sheer dumb luck if we produce uh, products, features that delight our, our customers. So um, yeah, start with why, but don't start unless you, you know why. And it's a nice test that very often people say it's obvious. I always say to them, well then write a feature hypothesis. And often what happens is it's not so obvious. So, and it's a good test. Uh, so if you can't write that feature hypothesis, you either don't know what you want, okay? So let's figure out what that is, or otherwise no one uh, wants what you have. Okay, so the way I would describe a survival of the fittest over survival of the fattest, the loudest, the hippo, so the highest paid uh, person's opinion. Um, just helps to, to ensure uh, that we're actually doing what is best uh, for our organizations. Okay, my next uh, spell, reducio uh, pluma, which is just simply reduce feature size. Very often what we try and do is like this big oversized truck. This is what we've got. These are the size of the features we're trying to take through in most of our systems, which unfortunately are normally on very narrow roads. So what happens, backs up everything, causes massive congestion, something goes wrong with that truck, everything else is blocked up behind us and we sit in gridlock on our on our flow systems. So <clears throat> really we want to be like that moped there, much more, I guess, agile, uh, easier to get through traffic. So smaller features, lean 101, smaller features uh, flow faster through the system. Um, so yeah, small and fast over large and risky. And really the question we're kind of posing to our business stakeholders often will say, no, no, but I need this, this and this. If you are able to phrase in this in this way and say, do you want to have this feature done in two weeks or two days sometimes even, uh, or wait two months or two years maybe if we do all this other stuff? And that's really the, the, um, the, the phrasing. And most business stakeholders, if you, if you ask them the question in this format, they'll say, give me that value as fast as possible. Okay, so small and fast over large and risky. Uh, just a quick illustration here, sticking with this password reset example. Um, some of these I might go through quite quickly uh, just because I want to allow a bit of time for, for uh, questions. Um, so uh, easy way to split something like password reset is by channel. So here yeah, it's just representing saying by email, we think 50%, by SMS by 30%, by USSD 10%, which adds up nicely to 90%. This will obviously take quite a lot shorter, 20 story points. These are just nominal figures than trying to do the whole of password reset altogether. So this will be like our moped will flow through the system much, much faster. Okay. Um, and then we can also then react to what the actual results are. So we only know what the actual result is once it hits production. And maybe we get 90% with password reset via email. Suddenly then SMS and USSD become a lot less important. If we get only 10%, it doesn't necessarily mean SMS and USSD are more important. It's an interesting result. We want to understand why. Maybe we've built our system so badly, it's easier to phone the call center than to use a self-service option. Or maybe people just don't know about it. Okay. So the next one I want to do is Akio Valorum, which is uh, show me the value. So just to illustrate this, it's so hard. So why we want to focus on value and not on money. Um, so let me actually pull up the whole slide. So what I've interested there is that the dark art. So Akio Denario, show me the money, I'm um, calling it dark art. So yes, ultimately we do want to make money, but if you chase money the whole time, you're going to end up uh, distorting your business and, and ending up the wrong things. If you go for value, money will generally follow. Um, so these figures here are from um, basically a continuous improvement stream um, that was done on a large system to get stuff done kind of four page positional papers, so small changes, the stated benefits, I think it adds up to about 236 million Rand uh, over two years. Uh, when business stakeholders tried to get other business stakeholders to actually say, this is how much money we really saved by these changes, couldn't get one of them to actually justify the actual amount. It's incredibly difficult. Although we always try to say, show me the money, okay, what's the bottom line? It's incredibly difficult to correlate directly financial benefits often to the changes that we do. And the way I'd just like to illustrate this is saying the USB port in your car. So most of you have got a USB, unless you've got a really old car, you've got a USB port in your car. 
it's highly unlikely that you'd buy a new car. Let's just say if you're looking at three cars equivalent in what you're looking for, um, maybe different brands, one of them didn't have a USB, you'd probably, that would probably be a, a deal break and you say, well, I'll, I'm gonna exclude that then and pick from the other two cars. But how much money, what is the value of having a USB in your car? Yes, there's a cost. You can quantify the cost often, but what's the value to the user? Incredibly hard to actually quantify. Um, in the case of, of password reset, it was actually originally came through like this. We'll save 800,000 Rand a month. Um, and, um, <clears throat> but it should come through as, um, well, that, well, that would be very, very hard to quantify. It should actually come through as this, uh, not, we wanna reduce it, uh, call center volumes by a specific amount. And the difficulty is, even if we were successful in reducing it by 90%, could we correlate to 800,000 Rand saving? Almost definitely not because it's, it's not a cause and effect type relationship. Yes, we definitely added value. We can show the top one chasing the value, chasing the money, very, very hard to actually go and show and to prove after the fact. And that's often why I think people just actually ignore it and they don't even, they don't even go that route. Okay. Um, same thing, just a few other examples there, that FX uh, transaction reports example I used earlier, we actually in that case, we achieved 80% benefit, that was deemed good enough. Did our traffic flow, flow improve the flow of traffic? In the case of the Circle and Bryanston Drive and Summit, definitely not. Um, and maybe just some other examples. So FICA, why do we do FICA? Supposedly to reduce money laundering and terrorism financing. Has FICA had any impact on that? I doubt it, but no one knows because no one's actually measured it or never, never did measure it. RICA, so have we reduced mobile phone theft and or fraud? In both of those cases, I think we've just made people's lives a lot more irritating and haven't had any, ben any benefit on the intention. And very often we don't measure it uh, afterwards. Okay, so really here the point is we want objective metrics over fairy tales. Most business cases, okay, and most regulations I would argue as well, are written as fairy tales. If we do this FICA thing, we'll stop money laundering. If we do this project, we go to the cloud, we'll save 500 million rand a year, but they really are fairy tales. So use um, your hypothesis, chase the value, the money will then uh, follow. Okay. Spell seven, uh, Specto, Notio, Excretum, Maximus. Okay, so I'm getting a little bit coarse here, so hopefully you've had a glass of wine and uh, you'll tolerate this one. But very simply, this is a test a shitload of ideas. Okay, so earlier on, we looked at this Harry Potter of software changes, a simple change that made Microsoft an extra $100 million a year. So simple laws of probability, okay? Microsoft, they'll stumble across a change like this once every five years maybe. And they've got a few, um, if you look at Ron Carvey's talks, I've linked a couple at the end, he highlights a few sort of 10, $20 million changes that they came across, but, but literally they do stumble across them and they happen every, every couple of years. So let's say once every five years, we've got one of these changes. Microsoft, they run 10,000 experiments a year. So if in your organization, you're running 100 experiments a year, and maybe that's quite a lot where you are right now. A lot of legacy organizations, they would be actually 100, trying 100 different things in a year. It's gonna take you 500 years to find your Harry Potter change. Okay, so that's, the, that's just very, very simple math. The more experiments you do, the more likely you are to find beneficial results. Okay. So yeah, there's poor Harry Potter stuck under the stairwell of uh, Uncle Vernon's, uh, the Dursley's house in uh, Little Whinging. And uh, your Harry Potter may still be stuck under the stairway virtually in your organization as well, not coming to life. So really it's not the ideas that you implement, but the number of ideas that you are able to test uh, that will determine the long-term success of your business. Okay. Uh, our next spell, spell number eight, is uh, uh, one from a lot of our childhood. You probably remember this, the Abracadabra or AB Ra Cadabra, as I'm calling it here. So this is all to do with AB testing. Um, so this is, I guess, a very crude and rudimentary <clears throat> AB test that I ran uh, in preparing for this talk. Uh, I just asked people which uh, talk title would you prefer? Harry Potter and the Quest for True Business Value or Outcomes of Forgotten Test Case. I think there were exactly 50 votes. And as you can see, 80% of people chose uh, the Harry Potter one. So that is the talk that you are looking at today. Probably would have turned out quite differently if I had gone with Outcomes of Forgotten uh, Test Case. Um, some more, uh, I guess, more uh, rigorous ones here. This is looking at Yuppie Chef. Um, so they just, all they did is they removed on their, on their wedding registry um, the navigation bar. 
and it resulted in a 100% increase in uptakes. I think it was a 2% that went to four or three to six, uh, something like that. Okay, so one simple change produced a big uh, result. I would probably guess that's because if I was looking at Yuppie Chef and I was allowed to buy beer, I'd probably find, I'd look at this and go, oh yeah, I wonder if they've got a special on beer and I'll go and click on that and get distracted and I wouldn't come back to the registry. Okay. Uh, another interesting example here is uh, 41 Shades of Blue. You can Google that. Um, this is how Google came up with uh, the color of their URLs, which is that dark blue. Um, they were having an argument over different designers over which was the best color blue. And someone said, hang on, why don't we actually do this as an online experiment? So at that stage, if you were using uh, Chrome, uh, you would have got, you would have been in a sample of users uh, split up into 41 different groups and slowly they figured out which got the most click throughs, which is why they settled on the, the sort of purplish blue. Now that might seem quite frivolous. What does this actually mean to Google's bottom line? Okay, an additional 200 million Rand a year. Okay, so that's what uh, that's the, the kind of the power that this brings. Although it's called A-B testing, I'd actually say it's almost A to N testing because you can, strictly speaking, you've got a control sample and you change one variable and you test that. But if you've got the right systems and processes, you can actually do a lot of, a lot of testing uh, to get these kind of results. Okay. Our penultimate spell, uh, actus non verbis. So this one uh, translates as actions speak louder than words. Um, so let's just see what the time is. Uh, I'll manage, I think I'll, what I'll do is I'll just talk through this rather than doing this as a poll, uh, just because I do want to allow a bit of time, uh, uh, time for questions. Um, so very often if you ask people, they, people will have a strong opinion. So what I often do is I run this exercise. I'll just explain to you how, how I've previously run this. Um, we'll should look at the existing OTP format and the scenario here is we want to reduce the amount of OTP errors and timed out OTPs. And we figure <clears throat> that because we've got a lot of information numbers on here, people are getting confused uh, with the numbers. So instead of ending one, two, three, four, five, I might end uh, this number over here, five, six, seven, eight, nine, or one of these other numbers, and also the numbers hidden away down the end over there. So this kind of then what I would ask people to do is to um, pick which of the challenges they think would win. Okay, so which is the best option here? We've got four different, we've got three different options, and we've got an existing champion, which would be the best, would produce the best result for us. So which would have the biggest impact on reducing um, incorrect OTPs and timed out OTPs? And we'd vote, and then normally what happens is we'll get a nice distribution of different people doing one, two, and three. Then not ask people to voice their opinion. Okay, so you're probably looking at this now going, okay, now this is the one I like. And what normally happens is you get a couple of people arguing really, really strongly for the one that they think. And that, that simulates an environment in the office where you've got different ideas about how to solve a problem. People have got different opinions. Normally what happens, whoever's the boss, the highest paid person's opinion will win. No, I think we'll go this way, okay? But maybe if there's for strong consensus and other ways, you'll pick something else. The problem is we actually don't know. And you spend a huge amount of time debating what is the best way. If you've got an experiment and experimentation platform, like companies like Microsoft do, you can actually test all of them very easily and then settle on the one that produces you the best results. So which one of these actually ends up in reducing um, the, the number of, of OTPs, timed out OTPs and incorrect OTPs. Um, there's a great example at Google as well. They were having the same thing, a debate about for an advert for um, hiring people. They had, I think, 10 different options from an advertising agency, couldn't agree. And uh, someone said, um, I think it was actually Marissa Mayer, she, um, at the time she became uh, eventually CEO of Yahoo. Um, but she said, why don't we just test this? We ran, they ran all 10. And the one that won was something that said, you're brilliant, we're hiring. Okay, so that had much higher click-throughs than the other nine. So they just killed the other nine very quickly. And that was the one that they ended up running. Okay, so you really don't know until you put it out there in the market. It's all conjecture and guesswork. And we saw earlier with Kohavi's law, we're actually really, really bad at guessing what the, what the actual results would be. Just another very simple example here from my everyday life. Um, so I'm actually sitting in my neighbor's house. We've got no power at the moment. So I'm sitting in my neighbor's house. Luckily, they've got an inverter. Um, so, uh, but assuming I've, my microwave oven was, was working. Um, so just think about this. Most of us have got microwave ovens. In the last week, which functions have you used on your microwave oven? Okay, in the last month, in the last year, in the last two years. Okay, 
when you bought that microwave oven, which functions did you think you were going to use? Okay, we've got all likely to have lots of fancy buttons, lots of all of these things. What do you end up using 99% of the time? The reheat button, probably for most of us. Okay, you're reheating food. In my case, I make uh, milk for my daughters at uh, at night time. That's the main thing that the microwave oven gets you. Oh yes, and microwave popcorn. That's the other big thing that uh, that our microwave gets gets useful. But they all it's basically the same button. It's just a timer button for, for different periods of time. Okay, so ask people what they want. Would you like this? Yes, they would. Get them to commit to it is a very different story. So actually monitor what are the actual uses, far more powerful than any kind of analysis or user survey that you can do. Um, and this is just from the standards group here. There is a link down the bottom. <clears throat> um, this is current data about features currently used. So you're looking at about 80% most, uh, according to their study, their information of features are hardly ever used or infrequently used, 20%. So it follows Pareto type, type things. Yeah, so make sure you get those main features right. You're getting the most benefit from them. Okay, and we're on to spell number 10. So which is Expelleramus uh, Rubra Corda, which is remove the red tape. So this is just an example I like to use also about autonomous self-managing teams, which is really what we want. So if you go into uh, Gmail, uh, which inter interesting enough was a non-planned project at Google. It came out of employees' own time. They famously give people 20%. Um, came out of that. And I write this email, autonomous self-managing teams, and I say, please see the attached file, and I click send. What happens? Okay, so a little message pops up, <clears throat> says it seems like you, you've forgotten to attach a file. Do you, is this correct? Do you want to continue? Yes or no, basically, is what it's asking me. So I, I think Office 365 have finally sorted this out. Uh, so it's finally there. Um, I found out, I guess, the hardware the easy way. So we've all done this. We've all sent the mail. Yeah, yeah blah, 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 is attached. We forget to attach it. You get 10 mails back telling you're an idiot. And oh, sorry, and you send another mail with the attachment. If you're like me, you might have doubled down and done it twice in a row, the same email and forgotten to attach twice. I've definitely done that at least once. Okay, then you could feel like a complete idiot. Um, but uh, this happened to a developer at Google, okay, using Gmail. And said, you know what, this is an easy problem to solve. And this was, this happened, uh, this was about 15 years ago at least, you could have done this in Gmail and it would pick, uh, pop, pop it up in this, uh, in this format. So this developer said, you know what, an easy problem to solve few lines of code. If I write a message with any of these phrases in like see the attached and there is no attachment, pop up a warning message. And if I click cancel, go back into the edit mode. If I click okay, uh, proceed with send. Okay, so easy problem to solve. Now because this developer worked at Google, they didn't have to ask their manager for permission. They didn't have to go through change control boards. They didn't have to uh, ask, you know, get budget or anything like that. They just went and did it. They could see a valuable opportunity. They could see a problem and knew how to sort it out. And they went ahead and did it. A question I always ask when I do training is, can you do this in your, if you saw the similar problem in, in your organization, so something on your system, problem like this, you knew the solution, you knew how to solve it. Could you just go ahead and add this value to your, to your customers, to your user base? And the answer is invariably no, unfortunately. Okay, so hopefully there is someone on the call who, who the answer is yes. Um, but really that's what we should be doing, is trying to remove this red tape, allowing our teams to deliver value as easily as, as possible. Okay, and just a final thought. So we've got 10 spells, but I thought we might as well just uh, cater for the muggles as well. So I've just got one last one here for the muggles, uh, which is communicare maximus. Okay, and really it's just optimized for communication. So, um, you know, so there actually is no magic involved in this. We're not pulling the rabbit out of the hat. A lot of the stuff is actually, you know, really is obvious, but, but really it's centered around communication. And for me, I guess the real magic of agile, the real value of getting the value out is having good communication. So without good communication, it doesn't matter what technically you do, what kind of experimentation you uh, labs you set up, what sort of technical things you do, um, you, you're not gonna, not gonna be able to achieve the value. Okay, so, and then your, your spells here, so just a, a last gap there, so feel free to, to add to this. And um, last question for you, okay, I'll ask it rhetorically because we are in questions time. Um, so actually, let me first just highlight here, I, have, I will make this available. What I will do is I'll pop, I'll pop the slide deck on my blog, which is down here at the bottom, uh, which is runningman.coza, man with two ends, my surname. 
uh, under the uh, category agile. Everything else is running. I've got a lot more running stuff on there, but I put all my agile stuff under this category. So I'll, I will post this here, uh, hopefully with the video uh, as well. Um, I'd also highly recommend taking a look at this book, Ron Kohavi's latest book, which he's co-authored as well. Uh, a couple of ladies, Diane Tang and uh, Sal Ya Yu, I've probably pronounced it terribly. Well worth looking at that around uh, A-B testing. It's where a lot of the examples come from in this presentation. Uh, great keynote speech here, also that Ron Kohavi did. Um, yeah, a very, very entertaining speech, highly recommended. Um, there's other ones online as well, so go and, go and check that out. Um, so uh, picture here actually is me reading to my daughter at the start of lockdown. <clears throat> I did a, a home Ironman, so it was my first and probably only ever uh, uh, triathlon I've ever done. And this was about 140 k's into the bike ride. I was trying to keep things fun, and my daughter said, "Can you read me some Harry Potter?" So I actually am reading Harry Potter uh, in this uh, in this picture here, uh, and that's my daughter in the picture. So the last question for you: What comes after the quest? Uh, the answer is questions. Uh, so there we are. I'm going to take a sip of water. I've been on four days of training, so my voice is. Uh, facilitating four days of training for my voice is just about to give out, I think. Um, so yeah, over, over to uh, question times and I will stop sharing the presentation now so I can uh, just see who's talking and uh, yeah, and any comments that come through in the chat. Okay, there was one question in the chat uh, and I'm not sure whether the person that was uh, asking the question would like to go online and ask it. Okay, let me let me actually put the question up. Uh, I, I think it refers to the 41 shades of blue slide and it says would be interesting to know how they measure the value on the blue. Uh, I'm not sure where, whether that's, uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, just if you Google 41 shades of blue, there's lots of nice articles out there. So basically what they did is, is on click-through rates because obviously they're making money via advertising. Um, and the relevance of their searches. So it was purely on click-through rates that they did it. And obviously they've got, I mean, I don't know how many users, but it's hundreds of millions, if not billions of users. So their sample is so huge. So, so tiny little changes would be st uh, statistically significant. Um, the other really interesting thing with that 41 shades of blue, it actually led to, there was a whole battle between engineers and designers at Google. And one of the head designers, I forget his name, he actually left Google in a very public huff and publicly stated that that was the reason it was ridiculous that uh, that you know being questioned and things like that. Um, the counter argument, which I think in retrospect he looks pretty silly, is that there are a lot of things that computers can decide much better than humans. So let them decide, you know. So um, yeah, and, and rather let the designers work on the true artistic stuff. Uh, but there was yeah there was this whole battle so it's an interesting backstory to go to go and look at and a few interesting articles uh, to read around it as well. Yeah. Great answer, Stuart. Any more questions? Anybody? That was my question. Thank you so much. I can't wait to look that up. Cool. So if there is no more questions, perhaps we can start wrapping up. Stuart definitely needs the rest. Um, it was a long day for many of us. Thank you so much, so much, so much for uh, being here. And the, yeah, Stuart, I don't know what to say. Uh, I'm sending you virtual bottle of wine. <laughs> That's funny in many ways, hey? Uh, anyway, all the best. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I was just thinking that the good thing is with, with at least with load shedding, it's so cold that my beers will still be cold when I get when I get back home. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, so I didn't think it was good form to rock up at my neighbor's house uh, with a beer when I asked them a favor to 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 borrow a plug in their and their Wi-Fi connection. Um, yeah. so I was actually planning when I was answering the polls. I thought it was a great tactic. So you do a poll, and then I can have a couple of sips of beer, and then uh, carry on with the presentation. So I've, I've been very diligent in uh, in waiting. So yeah. Okay. Great stuff, Stuart. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. See you at our next meetup, hopefully. Cheers. Great. Thank you, Stuart. Thanks, everyone. Keep Virtual off. hug to you, Stuart. Yes. Thanks. Thanks. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Thanks, Stuart. Bye-bye. Have you stopped the recording, uh, Yvanka? What did you say? I just was checking whether you stopped uh, the recording. Uh, the, um, uh, before I stop, I just want to ask...